once again greet you. It is really an honor and a privilege for me to stand uh, before you and bring God's word to you. I pray that God will bless us together. <coughs> I remember last time when I stood before you, uh, we looked at the uh, look in the book of uh, uh, Psalm 51, and we looked at a character called uh, David. And again, this morning, I'm still doing some characters. And I also want to bring another character to your attention. There's something that I really uh, love, or something that I really, I like shook my heart concerning this character that I want to bring to your attention this morning. Uh, let us open our Bibles. In First Kings chapter 16, and I'll begin reading from 29. First Kings, Kings is in the Old Testament. First Kings chapter 16, verse 29. I will read ahead of you. <clears throat> in the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, son of Omri, began to reign over Israel. And Ahab, son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria 22 years. And Ahab, son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord, more than all who were before him. And as if it, was, it had been a like thing for him to walk in the sins of the uh, son of Nebat, he took for his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ether, king of uh, Sidonians, and went and saved Baal and worshipped him, the Kitu. He erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria, and Ahab made an Ashura. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord the God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. Uh, like the way I alluded that you know there's something that I really wanted to get that, that got my attention in this passage to say uh, during the reign of the children of Israel, all the kings that were in the children of Israel most of them, they did evil in the eyes of the Lord. But scripture tells us that of all the kings that ruled uh, in Israel, Ahab did more uh, to provoke the Lord to anger. Allow me just to give you a background of what I want to bring to your attention this morning. Uh, the one who wrote the book of Kings really wanted to help us appreciate and understand the kings that ruled uh, during, uh, during the Israelites, especially the 12 tribe of Israel. And as you can remember, that the first king that ever saved uh, the Israelites was the, uh, was the king called Saul. Uh, Saul really saved well in his reign until he gave his kingship to, uh, to, to David. And also David did his part. He reigned as a king in Israel. Uh, for the Israelites, and also he handed over his kingship to a king called uh, Solomon. And then Solomon also, he had the opportunity to become a king in Israel. Then he handed it over to his son, Rehoboam. Now, church, I want you to remember this. Like, no, uh, from the time that Rehoboam became a king, that, were, that, that was when problems began to incur uh, during the time of the Israelites. And it was in this regime that we see that Israel, the 12 tribe of Israel, they were divided into two parts. There was a northern kingdom called Israel, and there was a southern kingdom that was called Judah. And we see that uh, the son of Solomon called Rehoboam, he was the one who was the king of the, 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 the southern part. But this morning, I don't want to dwell so much on the southern kingdom, but I want to draw attention from the northern kingdom. And from the northern kingdom, there was a man who was a servant of Solomon, 
who was Jeroboam. And what interests me about this man, scripture tells me that this man did, he was so wicked, uh, he was so deprived, he did all manner of wickedness before the eyes of the Lord. And we see that the thing that he did was he, he took away the children of Israel from the love of God and introduced them to idol worship or idolatry, as you can mention it. Just this morning, I want to, I've entitled the sermon, uh, The Depravity of Man, or maybe in simple term, The Wickedness of Man. As we read the passage that we read earlier, we come to see, I will, I will draw your attention, uh, First Kings chapter 16, starting from verse 1. We see a number of kings that came before, and the Bible is telling us that all these kings that passed through Israel, uh, they were all wicked. They did all manner of wickedness even before the eyes of the Lord. As if that was not enough, they even reached at a level whereby they began, to, uh, they began to worship other idols. They brought different kinds of idols uh, in the house of the Lord. And that did not please the Lord. And then here, in our interest part, we see this man uh, called Ahab. Ahab, as the Bible really tells us, if you see in verse 82, that Ahab was the son of Omri. Even the father Omri, he was also a wicked king. He did all kinds of evil before the eyes of the Lord. But among us, these, the Bible says, Ahab did more to provoke the Lord. Ahab did more to anger the Lord. He, ex he exceeded all his predecessors in wickedness. He did evil above all that we have before him. If you see in the state, as if it were done with a particular hatred, both to God and Israel, to affront him and ruin them. It is said he did more purposely to provoke the God of Israel to anger and consequently to send judgment on his land than all the kings of Israel that were before him. This picture really shows us how deprived man is. This picture shows us how wicked that man is, that regardless of what God had done for them, but man really goes back to his deceitfulness. When I look at this picture, it really reminds me of Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. The Bible says the heart of man is deceitful, or the heart of man is wicked above all who can understand it. So this is a picture that I would want to draw your attention this morning. And I want to ask, I, want, I would like to show you if from, from this passage how deprived or how wicked man is. It was bad with the people that when the, every successful king was worse than his predecessors, what would they come to at last? And we see that all those kings that ruled, especially from the southern kingdom, all of them, they became wicked. I want you to look, to look at your Bibles from verse 31. And I want to get the first point that I want to bring to your attention. The first wickedness that we see about Ahab was the depravity of man that we do not treat sin with his wickedness. We do not treat sin with his wickedness. We see from the one that Ahab, the son of Omri, in as much that he was wicked like all the other kings that came before him. But there's something that Ahab did that I would want us to, to see. So from 29, the Bible reads, let me start from faith. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. And as if it had been a light thing for him, walk in the sins of Jeroboam. 
Now we see that whatever that Ahab did was not was it was not new among his predecessors. All the predecessors that came before him, the Bible mentions that they were so wicked. But there's something that I picked up about Ahab that has, that made him to become a worse king or more wicked than any of these predecessors. Look at what the Bible that what, what the Bible is mentioning here. It says. Ahab, and as it had been a like thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam. Now, others they, they say as if as if it was a, a crivo, meaning that Ahab, in as much as the predecessors that came before him, they were wicked, but with him he took sin lightly. It, it, it never bothered him that no, he was able to sin against God. He didn't regard sin, he didn't quit sin with that wickedness that he deserved, whereby he felt sorry for the things that he did before Lord. But we, when you see Ahab, the Bible is reminding us that Ahab, you know, he enjoyed uh, committing sin. He enjoyed uh, being deprived. He enjoyed uh, doing all the kind of wickedness that was doing before God. And because of that, the Bible is telling us that, you know, of all the kings that ruled in Israel, Ahab was the worst. That also brings to our time. There are times whereby we are Christians, probably, you no, know, we have gone through all the time that God has saved us, we have been washed, we have been cleansed, we have been saved. But the problem that we are having is we are not ready to renounce. We are not ready even to give up our old ways. And we seem to enjoy living a life of sin. We don't even regret even when we, when we encounter sin. When a person reaches at that level, really brave, that is wickedness. Because when you are a child of God, you have the spirit of God within you. Whenever you feel you, you fall short of God's glory, there must be a conscious. You must feel, you know, you must have remorse. You must feel sorry for the sins that you have committed. But we see that Ahab, he was not that type. He enjoyed uh, causing, uh, he enjoyed to provoke God to anger. And that was the depravity that I saw, that I've noticed in this passage. But he did not regard he did not feel the wickedness or the heaviness for the sins. In other ways, he looked down. All oh, what he wanted was just to, to enjoy in the sins that he was doing. And then the Bible said, because he took, he, you know, he, he never felt the wickedness of sin. The Bible says he went and walked in the sins of this wicked man called Jeroboam. You see that the other king that were before him, that were able to, that, that he would have emulated their lifestyle, that he would have followed. But because he didn't take sin, he took sin lightly, the Bible says he followed the ways of this waste predecessor. It also brings to my attention, you find that maybe a working in environment where your, your immediate boss is, is a wicked man, or maybe he does dubious means to earn his living. And sometimes you find that maybe uh, you see the, 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 the consequences of what your, your, your immediate supervisor has gone through. Maybe has been sacked from work because of his carelessness, his carelessness, or maybe because of he has been involved in a bribe. Sometimes maybe we even sympathize with him that, you know, uh, of, what, of the pain that he may, he may have gone through, maybe he has been sacked from work, or maybe have given him a, a punishment because of his conduct, because of act. But the sad part is because man is deprived. In, 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 in the run cause, even as we end up taking the same route, even, even as we tend to do the same things that our immediate boss uh, tend to do. And this brethren, for me, I look at it, this is the issue of heart. This is a depravity. This is a wickedness that man has. The other thing I can, I can be able to, give, to bring to your attention, take for instance, here is this woman. Maybe she, uh, she got pregnant out of wedlock. Maybe accidentally find that 
she has children, maybe from different, maybe four, five, different men. And then as, as that woman begins to grow, he begins to raise those children under difficult uh, circumstances. Maybe this woman even tells his children, her children that don't do what I've done. You, you know, the children are able even to see the pain, the agony that their mothers have gone through, you know, just trying to raise them up. And, you know, the pain of, or the consequences of the mistakes that their mother did. But when the children also come to age, they end up going through the same route. And brethren, it is shame enough whereby you are able to see the pain that your mother has gone through. You know, it's not easy where you raise your children alone and basically all the children that you have, they are from different fathers. We expect that the children would have to learn their mistakes. They learn the mistake of their mother. But you discover that even the children they came to take the same route that their mother took. And this is a picture that we see about Ahab. Ahab was able to see what the Lord did to, 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 to his predecessor. Ahab was able to see the punishment, the judgment that the Lord brought to his predecessor. But sadly enough, we discover that even Ahab was able to go through the sins. And that is the reason because Ahab, he took the sins. Lightly. He never felt the weightiness. He never felt the heaviness of his sins. He took sins lightly. And we see the example that Ahab was able to go through the same journey. He was able to walk through the sins of this wicked man called Jeroboam. And, what, and that is a sad part that this man was able to do. Church, I would want to encourage us that sometimes... When the Bible brings in some examples of, of wicked men in the Bible, those wicked men that the Bible brings to attention, it is for this purpose that you and I today, we may learn from them, and, some, and if possible, we may try to make a difference in our lives. But because man is deprived, but because man is so wicked, we overlook the commandment of God. We, we overlook the precepts of God and we want to follow our heart desires. No wonder Jeremiah also occurred to say, man is wicked. Man is desperately wicked above all who can understand him. And also, I'm reminded from what the psalmist say in, uh, in Psalm chapter 1, this one Bible says, Blessed is a man that does not stand or that does not sit in the seat of scoffers. Let me just read it. It says, Blessed is a man that does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly or in the counsel of the wickedly. So we see that Ahab, he was a man that knew the law. He was a man that understood. Ahab was an Israelite. He knew all the laws, the Torah, the laws of Moses. But regardless of that, he came to overlook all those things. And he went on to do the evil that his heart desired. And all those things, they remind us to say, man is desperately wicked. That man is evil before God. Sometimes we may not walk, we, we may not be made like Ahab. We may not do what Ahab did. But one thing that you can understand is all of us, we are bound. All of us, we are, we are singers. All of us, we make a lot of mistakes. Sometimes the Lord will then bring to our attention some example that you know, you'd want us to learn from other people. But we normally overlook them and we want to go through the same mistakes that our that others have done before. And that is a sign, and that is a warning, that is a reminder, that is reminding us that like, all oh, man is wicked, that the heart of man indeed is deceitful. The other point that I would also want to, to bring to your attention, look at verse 32. 32. We see that Ahab, as if that was not enough to walk in the sins of this evil, uh, predecessor, the Bible says Ahab, he disobeyed God's command 
by marrying a young believer. Not only a young believer, but we see that Ahab went on and married this woman called Jezebel. I know most of us, when we hear Jezebel, it's not a word, it's not a name that is new to us. All of us, we know. If someone tells you that you are a daughter of Jezebel, I mean, that is, an, that is called for, that is an insult. Because we know what Jezebel stands for in the Bible. And we see that, no, this Ahab, the Ahab was a king of Israel. He had all the privileges of life. He was able to choose the best woman in his kingdom. But regardless of that, because his heart was deprived, he left all the godly women. And guess what? He went and sought to marry a woman called Jezebel. Maybe, if, maybe I would want to, maybe I can describe who, for the sake of maybe the young ones who may not know who Jezebel is. No, Jezebel was a wicked woman. She was a, an adulterous woman. She did all kinds of evil in her time. And that, the, the same woman, she was, she was a daughter of Ether the king of the Sidonians. In fact, Jezebel was not, even, was not even part of the Israelites. We see the first thing that Ahab did. The first thing was, was to neglect the commandments of Moses. He went and he married a foreigner. He went and he married a non-believer. And we know, according to the laws of Moses, the Lord did not permit them to do such a thing. But all those, we see that because man was wicked. Jezebel was a jailer, was a, was, a, was a woman who was zealous in idol worship. She was extremely arrogant in her nature. As if that was not enough, she was also involved in witchcraft and she was also into prostitution. If you want to, if you want to get more information, you can, you can, at your own time, you can read 2 Kings chapter 9. Verse 22. She was also a false prophetess. I like the way John describes her. Look with me in Revelation chapter 2, the strength. Bible says, Nevertheless, I have this against you. You have tolerated that woman called Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality, and the eating of food and the sacrifice to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely, unless they repent of her ways. I will strike the children dead then all the churches will know that I am the Lord who searches the heart. Just look at the kind of words that John was able to describe Jezebel. But Jezebel was a, was a prostitute. She did all kinds of evil in the eyes of the Lord. And of all the women that Ahab had in, a, in his kingdom, he left all the God women and he only went for this wicked woman called Jezebel. Church, this is a truth even in our time. You find that here is this young man who is a godly woman, or a godly man, who is faithful to do God's work. When the time for him to get married, he overlook all the godly women that are found in the faith, and he goes and he gets himself a wicked woman. Brethren, this is a time when elders or leaders or the members, they try to help such a man. This man says, we don't love him. Or maybe we are jealous of him. He then says, maybe I'll be able to change this woman. But look at the consequences. Look at what leg he has. Ahab thought maybe he would be able to change Jezebel. But in turn, Jezebel 
was the one who was able to change a heart. Church, I want to remind, I want to take this time also to encourage the single people. I want to also to encourage you that you know when it comes to when it comes to this part, let us be very careful. Because there are some women that may try to pretend to look as if they are, they, 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 they are godly. But when you come to understand, they are far from the things of God. And this is what we see in this book about Ahab. In fact, when you do a survey of the book of uh, the first Kings, we see that all the things, all the things that Ahab was able to do, it was as a, as a result of this evil woman called Jezebel. At least I've got a right. At least I can say something because I'm now eight years in marriage. I can also encourage the young people. But when it comes to choosing a woman, we need to be conscious. I mean, I've seen, I've seen young men, I've seen young ladies who have been so committed to the things of God. Once they get married, you see they begin to turn to shine away from the, from the means of grace. Yes, yeah, this lady... When it's time to go to church, she will, be, she will begin to bring stories, say, no, I can't go to church. Hey, there's this game that I want us to watch. There's this movie that I want us to show. All these things, they show to us that you know, marrying, and, and marrying a woman that is not godly, the Bible despises or the Bible discourages us. Men, don't go for the looks. Go for the heart. Because sometimes the look may deceive us. Here's a man say, if I want to, here's a woman says, the parents tells him, no, don't buy that man. No, if you don't let me, I'll kill myself. Listen, church, sometimes the elders, they can see what you cannot see. We may be deceived because we are, no, there's a term that we call, if I ask young people, we say, infatuation, right? No, we come to understand whereby you are infatuated. But brethren, when you marry, your eyes will be opened. <laughs> perhaps one, perhaps, perhaps one may wonder why does the Bible discourage uh, marrying non-believers? Please open with me. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter seven, verse three, and I will read ahead of you. Do not intermarry with them. Do not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for, the, for, for your sons. For they will turn your sons away from following me to save other gods. This was God that was giving an instruction to the children of Israel. Ahab was an Israelite, and one of the conditions for one to be an Israelite, you must memorize the Torah. You must be able to recite the laws of Moses. This was a man who understood the law. He understood at the chapter 7, verse 3, that because man is deprived, but because man is wicked, he overlooked all the instruction that God gave to them. Look at the warning that the Lord now gives and the Lord says, and the Lord's anger will burst against you, and you will be quickly be destroyed. Brethren, I want to be strong on this point. But if you want, if you want to continue to serve the Lord faithfully, marry a godly woman, or get married to a godly man. I'm not saying that when you marry, when, when, when you marry your fellow Christians, you will not have problems. I'm not saying that. All Christians, they go through arguments. They go through a lot of here and there. But the bottom line is this. Both of you, you are converted Christian, and you have the spirit of God within you. Whenever you reach at a level whereby you want to go astray, the spirit of God will, will remind you. Also, it is also easy for the counselors to help you because we know that God, the Spirit of God, dwells within you. Church, the bottom line that I want to bring to your attention is this. We are afraid of losing you. We are afraid that, no, you may be, you may be led astray. We are, we are afraid that, God, you may run away from saving God and saving 
I go through. And we see that Ahab, he was a man who knew all these things. But because his heart was deprived, we see that he went the other way around. Maybe to, to, no, to, to, bring, to, to bring my case even to your attention, you can also read 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 and 16. Bible says, do not be equal yoked with unbelievers. I'm not speaking from without. I'm speaking, I'm quoting what the Bible is telling us. So when young men, when people tell you these things, they are real. And it is for your own good. Ahab thought that he was a wise man, but look at where it led him. He became the worst sinner. He became a wicked king. In fact, among us, all the Israelites, he was the worst king. Because he took his sins lightly. And that also brings me to the third point. Look at what this woman did to Ahab. This woman introduced Ahab to idol worship. This woman introduced Ahab to serving idols. The third point that I would want to bring to attention is a man who is deprived, who learned himself in worshiping and serving idols. Sometimes one may wonder, say, Pastor, there are no idols nowadays. Idols were in the Old Testament. Yes. Even now, there are still idols. Anything that comes before God, anything that you treasure more than God can be an idol. Look with me in Luke chapter 4, verse 8. Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Anything that comes before God, anything that you treasure, anything that you love more than God, brethren, that is your idol. Some of us have idolized our, wife, our wives. Some of us have idolized our, our husbands. Some of us have idolized even our careers. Anything that comes first before God, brethren, that is an idol. This is what Joshua chapter 24, verse 14 and 15. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods of your fathers, worship him beyond the rivers and Egypt. Serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourself this day whom you serve. Where are the gods of your fathers? Safe beyond the rivers or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, who will save the Lord. Here Joshua is giving us and he's, 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 you know, he's, he's commending us, he's telling us, choose whom you are going to worship, choose whom you are going to save. There are times whereby we treasure things so much that we even tend to abandon the means of grace. We don't even care so much about the things of God. All what we care is about ourselves and the thing that we treasure. I want to, you know, here the Bible is giving us a warning. But anything that comes before God, anything that we treasure more than God, that may lead us to an idol. And here Joshua is reminding us that we need to make a decision. Look at Exodus chapter 20, verse 4 and 5. You shall not make for yourself an idol in form of anything in heaven and above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow to them or worship them. For I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God. I don't want to go through the Bible study that Elder presented. But the point he says, I, the Lord, am a jealousy God. In other words, God does not want to share his glory with anybody. So what I'm trying to bring to attention is anything that comes before 
God. Anything that you treasure more than God, just know that that can eventually become an idol. You see, in the state one, how, how Ahab became so depraved. Look at what he says in the one. The other depraved that we see in Ahab, that he began to save Baal. In as much as he was saving Baal, he was even able to erect altars. You know, an altar, it was a place for the Israelites where they would offer their sacrifices for God. But look at how extreme how Ahab went. He went and began to offer sacrifices for Baal. This was an Israelite. The one that was, who, was, who knew all the, all the laws of Moses. Because of a woman, he overlooked all the commandments. As if that was not enough, he also went and began to offer sacrifices that were intended for God. And he offered them to this goddess. To this goddess called Ashwa. He even erected the altar for this What kind of idol that you have in your life? Which is the thing that takes you, that takes the place of God in your life? What thing that you treasure so much more than God in your life? Here scripture is reminding us that we need to forsake all those gods and we are, we ought to save All these things that have brought your attention, it is as a result. Because Ahab did not take sin. He, you know, he took sin lightly. You know, I like the way the, the Bible says it was a trivial. He, he, he never took it lightly. And because of that, this is where it landed him. The second sin that we do in our life, they look so small. They look so innocent. There are some deals that you may want to do. They are so, you know, they don't amount to anything. But let me tell you one thing, church. Sin is sin. And God is going to judge everything. It also reminded in Ecclesiastes where someone was talking about the little, little foxes. The same thing that we overlook in our lives, but they are completely eating us up. They're eating us up. You used to be so active in the, in the means of grace. Maybe you abscond from church one, one Sunday, twice. Eventually you backslide. And that's how sin starts from the little things. When you begin to overlook certain things. Ah, no, there's no problem. I can go to a bar. Since I'm not drinking, there's no harm. And that's how it starts. Anyway, because he, she is my friend, I can, I can, she can be my friend or my friend. But the Bible is discouraging us mingling with unbelievers. So these little, little things, when we overlook them, that is what comes at the end. We see the example of Ahab. But because he overlooked the commandment of God, he chose to give a blind eye to the voice of God. This is what landed him. Well, as I'm concluding this morning, I've got two points that I want us to take home. In as much as Ahab was a wicked man, in as much as Ahab did more evil to provoke the Lord to anger, but there's something that Ahab did that I want to bring to your attention. When, you know, the Bible says in Romans chapter Chapter 3, verse 23. But for the, for the wages of sin is death. Church, there are consequences for our mistakes. There, there, there is always a consequence. There is always a consequence for our sins. Look at what 
Ahab. What? Look at the, the, the judgment that the Lord brought upon Ahab. In 1 Kings chapter 21, this 18, 19. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, the Kishabite. Go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, who rules in Samaria. He is now a, a Naboth vineyard, where he has gone to take possession of it. Say to him, this is what the Lord says. Have you not murdered a man and he seized his property? Then say to him, this is what the Lord says. In place where dog licked up neighbor's blood, dog will, leap, will lick up your blood. This was the punishment, the judgment that the Lord brought upon Ahab. If you see in, in the first Kings 21, we see that here is, uh, here is the servant of Ahab who was owning a land, and because Ahab was a, was, was a greedy man, the Bible says that there was a time whereby he was so lawful in his home, and then his wife, the wife uh, Jezebel came to him and said, why are you downcast? And then Ahab said, look at that man, he got my vineyard. Look at the wicked woman, told Ahab. Why are you troubled? Are you not a king? Just go and kill him. And we see that Ahab, because he was, his heart was deprived, he went and killed an innocent man. And we see that God now comes to judge Ahab. Church, you may hide from you may hide from the leaders. You may be so wise, you may be so careful in your sins, but one thing that I want to remind you one day, sin will catch up with you. As we see Ahab, that one day, sin was able to catch up with him. There are always the consequences for our, for, for our dealings. There are always the consequences when we walk in sins. And this is what we see in the life of Ahab. You may think as if the Lord is not watching. You may think as the Lord is not there. But let me tell you one thing. That judgment will not escape those who are doing evil. But I love something about Ahab. In as much Ahab was a wicked king. In as much as Ahab did all kinds of evil. In as much as Ahab killed. But when Ahab realized his mistakes... He went and he confessed before God. David began to echo, if I hide my sins in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. We see that Ahab, despite him being a wicked king, but when he discovered how far he went away from the Lord, the Bible says he pleaded with the Lord. And we see God's grace upon Ahab. Look with me from verse 28, 29. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, the Kishbite. Go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, who rules in Samaria. He is now a neighbor's vineyard where he has gone to take possession. And we see that down after, when, after this verse, that the Lord forgave him. That the Lord relented. The Lord sent back Elijah that can, can tell my servant, go to my servant and tell him that I've relented. That I will not bring judgment upon you. We see the grace that the Lord showed upon Ahab. That despite how evil, how deprived he was, how wicked he was, when he repented, the Lord relented, bringing calamity upon him. The Lord forgave him. Church, this is good news. That no matter how far you have gone from God, no matter how sinful you may be, but when you come before God, the Lord he is faithful 
and just to forgive you. Look at, jo look at how, how, how Jonah described the goodness of God. Jonah chapter 4, this 1 to 4. But Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. He prayed to the Lord, Oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? That is why I was so quick to flee to Tashish. I know that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love. God who relents from sending calamity. Church, we save a good God. Bible says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray, seek my face, and turn away from the wicked ways, then I'll hear from heaven, and I'll forgive their sins, and I'll heal their land. I'm reminded of a woman, the woman who had committed adultery, and according to the laws of Moses, such a woman supposed to be stoned to death. And here are these men, the Pharisees, that were ready to stone this woman. And when they make Jesus, Jesus taught them one thing, that if any of you has not seen, let us stone this woman. The Bible says, as Jesus was writing, was looking on the ground, he discovered that everyone, they fled away from the woman. And then Jesus looked at the woman and he said, where are these men? The woman said, they're gone. And then Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Why are you living a life of denial? Why are you living a life of compromise? Why are you living a life of pretense? Church, there is a way out. Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Jesus left heaven. He came down on earth so that you and I may receive salvation. Salvation can only come through Jesus Christ. This heart of depravity, this heart of wickedness, it is only Jesus who can end this. You may try with your own power, with your own strength. Believe me, you, you cannot manage. But if you can surrender it to Christ, the grace of God is sufficient. Some of us are still struggling in our sins. Regardless that you are believers, you are still struggling. Yes, I understand, because you are doing it with your own strength. Why can't you give it to Christ and trust Jesus? He will be able to help us. Amen. I'm going to ask you to see the choir to help us with a response song, and I'll pray.